I think most of you here already know who Kevin Callan is, <laughs> so I will let him take the show from here. Welcome, Kevin. It's really good to have you back at the Oh, great. Thanks. I, I like this time of year. Uh, I'm all excited because I, I, I go at early morning to a, do a trip. Um, what I'm going to do tonight for you, I'm going to talk about this trip I did in Algonquin five years ago. Um, and I'm going to show you the route and a few things that happened along the way. And I, I, five years ago, I put it in a video series on, on my Happy Camper YouTube channel. And what I did is I got all the, the good parts and made it into a nice 25 minute or 20 minute piece. So, uh, Algonquin, who's been to Algonquin? Okay, so the average portage in Algonquin is 1,000 meters, right? So it's just crazy, but I have this love of affection with it because it's that familiar place that you go to every year and you curse it when you get there, but you still like it because of it. And um, what happened was, I was coming back from that, that show, Canoe Kopi, actually, uh, about five years ago, and I got on the airplane, and the airplane got stuck in the tarmac for a long time, and everybody started getting all nasty, and the guy beside me smelled so bad. And uh, so I had to go to my happy place, so I went through my pack and found an, an Algonquin map, and I started looking at where I was going to go canoeing once I got back. And I, I heard about this thing called the Minas Link. So Algonquin Outfitters, a few years back, connected a whole bunch of dots around the park uh, to connect all the six watersheds to get their staff to go out on this really big canoe trip. So it's, uh, it's uh, I think four, what was it? I, I think 250 kilometers, but it's got 55 lakes, six rivers, three up river, 102 portages, 68 kilometers of portaging, right? So I had just turned 50, so I said, hey, you're supposed to do something epic when you're 50. That sounds like a good idea. So I got home and I phoned my buddy Andy and he said, Andy, I got this great trip. You turn 50, I turn 50. We should do this thing called the meanest link. He goes, what's that? I go, well, well, I'll send you the information. I did, but he never looked at it. He never, because he's, I always plan the trips. And he goes, wherever, Kevin, whatever. So I show up, at, I packed for three weeks and he's at, he's at his doorstep and we, we head out. And the very first place we started is Huntsville. And then we went up the Big East River. The Big East River is not even in the park yet, but that's usually where everybody, doesn't make it. They usually abandon the trip at the Big East River. The Big East River is just rapid, rapid, rapid for four days. And you can't pull it, you can't line it, you just have to walk up it for four days. And uh, on the day two, <laughs> he's like, where are we going? <laughs> I said, we're going around the park. We're going all around the whole park. And he's like, this is the stupidest thing we've ever done to cover. And um, there is a funny story. The very first time I, I paddled with Andy, he was my neighbor years ago. And I, we, we did a 28-day trip in Quetico when I was working on a Quetico book. And I didn't really know the man. He's just my neighbor. And it was a really hot, humid night. And I go in the, the tent, and he's lying on the sleeping bag completely naked. I was like, whoa! <laughs> you know, I don't know if we could be doing that the whole trip. And he goes, oh, well, I, I sleep naked, and I don't need a sleeping bag tonight. I went, no way, man. No, no, no. So I've been teasing for years about, about that. Well, the second night of that trip, it was downpouring rain, it was really humid, really buggy, and I was soaking wet, so I just go into the tent, get completely naked, lie the, on the tent, I was sleeping bag beside him naked, I said, we should never talk about this again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, we, so we head out on the trip, and um, I'll show you what the route is. So that's the trip. Oh, it's 420 kilometers, not 250. Uh, and basically, the Gonquin Outfitters uh, did this to join all their stores together. Uh, I, that really didn't, I didn't care about, about that. It's also called the meanest link because uh, B Bill Swift Sr., when he was alive, was known to be a mean dude. So they call it the meanest link. I, that's a pretty boring story, so I just thought it was a, a good reason to go on a trip. I just finished writing a book about it. It took me five years to write the book. Uh, this is my 18th book, but it's my first book I self-published. And I just, another bend in the river, I wanted to try something different. And uh, uh, it, it was terrifying, because lots of money investing, and then it's great, it's fantastic. It was really good to tell a story. This is a totally different book than I usually do. I usually write a guidebook with some stories behind it, or a how-to book. This is all about, yes, our trip. So it's almost like a Bill Bryson Walk in the Woods book, mixed in with uh, a Bill Mason Song of the Palo book, with uh, Sigurd Olson Lonely Land, all mixed up in it like a salad. But it talks about the history of the park. Uh, it talks about the future of the park. It talks about the, the changing of ethics of, of, of paddlers out there. Um, about a whole bunch of things that were going through my head at the time. Uh, so it's more of a storyline than anything else. So, <laughs> I love this part. Who, who would play us if the book became a film? <laughs> so Andy thought this would be perfect for him. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm taking more. <laughs> he looks identical to Red Skeleton. He sounds like him too. Uh, I thought for me, these people would be really good. My, uh, my mother suggested these guys, but they're all dead. I put this on social media and this is what people came up with. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> so yeah, we started in Huntsville. You can start anywhere you want. There's not a lot of rules. Uh, basically, you can do it as fast as you want. A lot of people think of it as a race. We did not want to do it as a race. The record was seven days. That's insane. Good for them for doing it. Uh, but uh, we, we, we want to go and spend most time in the woods and enjoy our time in the woods, not race through it. So we decided to do that. The problem is we also did other things different than some traditionalists. And I'll get, get later on to the story about this, but we had a whole bunch of, well not a whole bunch, it was five people hating my living guts. They, were, they called me the looser of Algonquin when I was doing this trip because I didn't do it traditionally. We didn't do it as a race. We didn't use a prospector cedar canvas canoe. I used the canoe I have on my roof right now that's like 38 pounds because I'm smart. <laughs> uh, we did three food drops. You're not supposed to do a food drop, but there's no rule saying you're not supposed to. Like it's just these people saying you're not supposed to do a food drop. So um, it, it gets better once I explain what happened because of that. So we head out from Huntsville. It was a massive flood that spring. We left the first week in June and uh, we saw what was left over the flood. Everything just flushing down the, the Big East. The Big East River on the south end, if you want to do a really nice day, day, day trip or overnight trip, just go up from Huntsville or even just the highway itself and go along the, the lower part of the Big East and it's a non-operating park. And it's just sand embankments where you camp. And it's a really beautiful place to camp. So that was great. We, we thought, hey, this is beautiful. This is fantastic. And then it turned into this. So that's where we just had to get out and walk. And that, this is in high water. So I don't think you could even do this route in the summer. You have to do it in the spring when the bugs are out and the water levels up. Why clockwise? Because if we went counterclockwise, we would have to go downstream of this, and that would make sense. But it also would meant that I had to go upstream on the Nip Nipissing River, which was the longest river in on the trip. Yeah, Andy's not impressed at this point. <laughs> <laughs> then we, we're not in the park yet, so we still have these issues of trespassing on private property if we wanted to portage around rapids. But Gord Baker, he was one of the initiators that, that organized this. He, he's the manager of the uh, uh, Oxtung store of Algonquin Outfitters. And he told us, he goes, guys, when, when you're going up the Big East River, you might see this legendary woman that she bathes naked all the time. You might see her. And I think he was joking with us just to keep us going, right? So Andy was not happy with this trip. And I said, just around the corner, we'll see. You know, it will happen. And sure enough, we come around the corner and there's a naked woman. Like, there she is. It's the mermaid of the Big East River. And then the husband's in the forest. Uh, you got a problem? <laughs> so, so we kept going. <laughs> this area was really nice of, of the Big East because there was a big, huge dam here at one time, but they dismantled it back in the 50s and it, nature took over. So it was kind of neat to pal through there. But again, we're still doing this most of the time. And this is what happens eventually. You get to McCraney Creek and you can't walk any further. And this is high water. So what, what we had to do then is we had to portage into Algonquin. So stand here, is that better? Uh, we had a portage into Algonquin. Now there's two portages cut. The, the, the park cut two portages to get into McCraney Lake. At that time, there was, wasn't anything. We actually had to bushwhack for about uh, almost four kilometers up this hill to get to McCraney. So uh, that's our route. But now they created this. And a really good trip, to be quite honest, is to go to Rain Lake in Algonquin, go to McCraney, do those portages, and then paddle down the Big East River. Don't ever do what we did. It makes no sense. <laughs> we brought that bug shelter. It saved our lives. Uh, the bugs were, I've never seen that many mosquitoes in our lives. I'll, I'll show you on film. And I've been to the far north, James Bay and everything, and I've never experienced mosquitoes like that. There was some rewards in this area. We didn't see anybody. And, um, well, so <laughs> anyway, the, the <laughs> but also because of the territory, the loggers never could get into here, so all the trees were, were there. So it was kind of cool. Uh, huge, that's what, those are cedar trees, they're, they're huge. Then you know when we're in Algonquin Park and we get to McCraney because the moose pose for you. <laughs> right, you know when you're in Algonquin, we're like, when they're all used to, 
We actually met a couple on that, uh, on McCraney, and they had just started their trip, and they were clean, you know, and we looked terrible. And they're like, where'd you guys come from? Hell, we just came from hell. <laughs> so uh, we got our first food drop on Rain Lake. Someone dropped it off for us, so that was great. We camped there, and then I dropped off one of two paddles. There's this thing that's going on. They, I had, last year they took that year off, but they're now going back to it. It's called Paddle, paddle in the Park. So these volunteers uh, get a bunch of us to put paddles in parks along portages, and if you find them, you win the paddle, you win prizes like a canoe uh, and everything else. And it's like huge, people go nuts. But there's one particular guy, Chris, uh, I forget his last name, but this guy Chris has found five of my paddles. And I jokingly, he's a really nice guy, but I jokingly call him my arch nemesis because he's never slept in the woods once. And the idea about this whole thing is to get people out in the woods on trip but he's done it all in the day. So I hit a, p a paddle in Algonquin during this trip on the Dixon Bonfield Portage. So for him to get this paddle, he, he lived in North Bay, he drove down to Lake Obiongo, paddled across that 16 kilometer lake, went and did the five kilometer portage, found my paddle, went back the same way, went home for dinner. Oh. And I, I, I emailed him, I went, that's not, that's not right. <laughs> so the, the next year, uh, I hit it in Great Mountain Lake in Killarney, and I don't know if you know about Great Mountain Lake, but it's not easy to get to at all. You have to do a 3,800 meter portage up a hill, and it takes at least two days to get there. He hit it, did it in a day. So the next paddle, I hit it in the courses just near my house, and he was visiting friends, and he found my paddle. <laughs> so what happened was, I knew he was going to be at the uh, Toronto show this year in my audience, so I'd made this video up for him. This is hysterical. Oops. Hey, Angel, how you doing? I'm talking to Preston. Hey, Preston, how you doing? I just really weird your dream last night. Uh, I was like, you were in the woods looking for the paddle. I was running after you. And then I had to turn you around and... Preston, Preston. It's Chris Hawking! Ah! He was that guy, Chris Hawking. fun with that. All right, I'm gonna put this back. So then we went along the uh, the um, the west side of Algonquin where all those black portages are and they're, they're non-operating or not, non, not really well maintained and we're averaging six kilometers per day on portages. Uh, but at one point, we, so I had to do single carries. I usually do double carries, but there's no way I was going to do double carries. So Andy carried the boat with a pack with the food in it, and I carried a full pack with all the other gear on it. And we're out of shape at this point, but later on in the trip, we're getting better in shape, so it wasn't hurting as much. But on this one, it was like, man, this Algonquin's got a lot of portages. I was able to communicate with people um, at the outside world. This, uh, this device now called the Spot X. I was testing it for the company to see if it would work, so they were giving me all the, the new stuff. And I was able to send a signal out, but I couldn't get a, a, a signal back. I was also on CBC radio every few days talking about the trip. So I didn't know this, but I had gathered a crowd of over 11,000 people following this trip, right? So I didn't know because I couldn't hear that back. This is where it gets interesting. That's when the five people went on social media and, and cursed me, called me the Lucifer. And the 11,000 people were like, no, He's smart. What's, what's wrong with you? And it creates this huge debate that I didn't know anything about, right? So it gets better in, in a minute. <laughs> These bugs were insane, especially in the Nipissing River. I love the Nipissing River because I'm a trout angler, uh, and it's just incredible for, for brook trout. And he could care less. He didn't really like it that much at first because it's a meandering river. But once you get into the big pine, there's massive white pine with old beards, moss dangling from it. Tons and tons of moose. Uh, in one particular one night, though, 
We stopped to make camp, it was late, and there was a moose on the campsite and it wouldn't move. And finally we had to say, go on, it's a big huge bull, right? And so it just peed right on the tent spot. So we're like, oh man. So uh, we got into the bug shelter and then slept in that instead. And while we're sitting there, it was about 11 o'clock at night, we're having a dram of whiskey and we heard a movement and there was a moose feeding in front of us in, in the water. By the time it was just like 12.30 at night, we had seen seven moose pass us. It was amazing. Yeah, it was a buggy spot. Massive pine along the Nipissing River. What's really cool is we actually found remnants of, uh, of uh, old lumber camp, and I didn't know this, but it was actually also a POW camp uh, during World War II. And when the war was over, a whole bunch of those prisoners moved back uh, in, into that area just to live. They loved it so much. So. We were supposed to stay at the Nipissing cabin. It's just too buggy. It was just crazy, and there's a bunch of snakes in there. Didn't like that. So we just moved on. But you can actually go and rent this cabin if you want. Well, not now. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have told anybody that, yeah. This is where the trip really ch changes for us. We're on the Nipissing after that, that cabin. And we're in the bug shelter because the bugs are bad. And Andy finally said, why are we doing this, Kevin? Like, this is not us. We're not racers. We're not a, a personality people. And this is kind of foolish. Uh, why don't we actually just change the route and just head out? And I even kind of agree with him. But what's really weird is that we've never done that before. One of the number one rules we've always had on trip is never to end a trip early. Because we spend so much time preparing and wanting to be out there, to bail, it just didn't make any sense. So we're like, well, you know, I don't know. And then right then we saw the snapping turtle move up on the bank, and that was our entertainment. We're having a wee dram, and we're watching the snapping turtle. It took 26 minutes for this turtle to get to the top, and then it tripped on itself and fell all the way down. And then he goes, I think we should continue because we don't have the life of that poor beast. <laughs> So we get to Brent on Cedar Lake, and that's our second food drop, but the outfitter's there. And this is where it really changes. Uh, interesting. I get my box, uh, the outfitter there gives it to me, and I open it up, and the food's there, but my whiskey supply is not. And I was like, oh my god. And so I went on social media and on CBC Radio, I said, for the love of god, someone stole our whiskey, please help us, we're going to die out here. And I was kind of joking, but I didn't again know all these people were following it, and it found out that actually it was one of the guys that didn't like me took the whiskey. I found out later who it was, and he, and he did it maliciously. He didn't do it as a joke. And um, so what happened, all these people started palling in to delivering us whiskey. Like, lots of people, right? We would get to a portage and there'd be a sign saying, way to go Kevin, and keep going, there'd be a flask there, and it was unbelievable. We were going across Radiant Lake. If, you ever have, if you've never been to Radiant Lake, just to uh, go to somewhere different, that is an amazing lake. It's all circled around with sand, sand beaches. An easy way to go, get in there is go to Windigo Lake on the top end, and it's a day paddle, easy portaging, get to Radiant Lake, and then paddle back the same way. So that's a really good trip. So there was a force. Yeah. Pardon? The ice up? We were going to go tomorrow. Yeah, I was supposed yeah. to go tomorrow. I had to change my plans. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, they're actually, was it May 10th? They're, they're saying Obiongo is open, but it's still ice. So, yeah, I don't know. You know, what rains there tomorrow. Yeah, yeah it will, it'll happen quickly, but it's going to be a really buggy spring, though, because it's so wet. Well, that's yeah. Long, yeah, I know. <laughs> there was a forest fire burning. That was interesting. Made us pallet faster. There's, there's this one yeah. sign. Um, we went up the Crow River. This uh, is an amazing part of the trip. If you ever have a chance to go on the Crow River, like I, I read this one book, um, The Incomplete Angler, and it was written, written I think in the 50s, or even the 40s, and they caught an amazing amount of trout on the Crow River. It hasn't changed a bit. The reason why, it's in, insane to get there any way you go. But uh, um, basically you're portaging along the Crow River the entire time. This is a lower Crow, not the upper Crow. But we went along there, uh, and man, the amount of trout was just incredible. I think I caught over 35 of them all, around two pounds to four pounds, right in one spot. So uh, then we went to the Lavier, and we're supposed to go and cheer Algonquin Outfitters owner that passed away on this one island. We did, and I don't know if you've been to Lake Lavier, but it's an amazing gem of Algonquin. One thing that is happening there is Dixon and Lavier is being hit by uh, um, uh, what's that green stuff? Algae, thank you. <laughs> and they don't know why. Dixon is really bad for it and it's moving into Lavier. 
Uh, Dixon is actually more shallower than you think, so maybe that's why, but they, they don't know what's going on. It could be global warming, it could be cormorants pooping in the water, we're not sure, but actually, but it is, the park is changing a lot. Oh, cool, I uh, didn't see anybody on the, the whole Crow River stuff, but did see a, a, where a, a wolf ate a bear cub. You can see its bear claws, its teeth in there, that was kind of cool. Well, not for the bear cub, but, and that's the book, and that, that was the trout. And that's Lake Lavier. Lots of history in, in that lake. There's actually two Hudson Bay posts that were there at one point. It was a big trading area. Oh yeah. <laughs> we get to Dixon Bonfield Portage and Andy, Andy was done with Portage. And this is the longest Portage in the park, right? And I said, oh, it's only 500 meters. <laughs> it is not, it's five kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> And this is where it gets really silly because, see, Andy only had 16 days of holidays. So he said, I don't have the three weeks. I'll have to leave you at some point in the trip. So the idea is that he was going to, <laughs> um, he was actually uh, uh, going to leave me at Obiongo and then I was going to continue solo. Well, ended up after all this stuff that happened, he said, I got to finish this trip with you. So I said, the only way we can finish is we have to really push a lot and we have to cheat. And it's not cheating if you're telling everybody on CBC Radio that you're cheating. Like, that's not cheating, right? So we got to Obiongo, and I got the satellite phone, and I called the outfitter, and they shuttled us across the lake. And everybody's laughing at it, except these five people. They're like, they were really cursing me. I went, whatever. Like, what, what's the other choice do I have? To finish the trip without my friend. Like, I don't really care if you get a ribbon for this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to cheat. And we even portaged, or we, got a, we hitchhiked on what's called Portage Road. We hit, put our thumbs out, got a ride. So at one point it became just funny. This is kind of where the trip kind of went downhill. We get to uh, Obiongo and then we get into where all the campgrounds are. And then we start seeing people that were different. Um, I, I, the most dangerous part was actually portaging across the Highway 60. Oh my lord, it was insane. But when we met these people we were portaging, remember we had been out for over two weeks, right? And uh, full gear and everything else. And I got the, big, the canoe at that time. And there was people walking up from the beach with just sandals, and they didn't move. They, we had to go off into the bush to get out of their way. And I lost them. I said, what are you, why would you not move for us? And they go, well, what, was there a sign saying we have to move for you? I go, no, it's called portage etiquette. It's etiquette. You, 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 you live your life like that. You don't, have, you don't need a sign. Oh, and they just thought, blah, 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 blah. And I said, what is going on? And the other thing is, nobody said hello to us. I passed people on the portage, hello, nothing. Like, that's somewhat bizarre how things are changing now. It's almost like this closed in world, right? Oh, we get to the Oxtong River and I said, Andy, I love this river. It's a fantastic uh, two day trip. It's along Highway 60. Nobody really paddles it, and you, you think they would because it's right along the highway. It's great trout fishing, lots of moose. Uh, but they, they were doing some work on the highway and then closed the dam, and the whole thing was just drained water and it stunk, and we walked the Oxtong River. It was like going back in time, Groundhog Day from the Big East River. So our last campsite, we, we, there wasn't any. It was all cottage lakes, and we were wondering where to stay. And this guy said, well, you can stay in my backyard. And it ended up to be Jack Hurley, and he's the guy that makes the legendary Pathfinder canoes. So he, uh, he, we helped him make one, and we stayed in his backyard. It was kind of cool. Another sign, more alcohol. <laughs> this is when they were really serious. Oh, and then we almost got arrested. Um, so, <laughs> so we, we had like an hour left to finish the trip. And uh, we're going across the, the main cottage lake. It's a big lake. And then these, these guys, it was the, the male cop and the female cop. One, the male cop was like power hungry. And the other, the other person you could tell did not like him. So they pulled up beside us to do a check. But their wake was just going to flip us. So I said, whoa, like get back, get back. Uh, you're going to flip us. Don't you tell me what to do. I was like, what the heck? I've been out for three weeks in the bush. You think I'm going to dump right now? This is insane. So I pushed his boat away. Oh, that wasn't good. So he goes, where's your safety things? I went, what, what safety things? What do we need? You tell me. And, and he's like, Kevin, don't end the trip like this. I go, well, he deserves what he gets. So, so he, you know, he labels the things, but he's missing the throw bag. I went, no, you got all of them except one. He goes, well, what is it? I went, well, I'm not telling you. And by then, the female officer is laughing at him. And of course, he gets mad. And we leave when there's a big, huge discussion going on. <laughs> 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 so 
So we finished the trip in Huntsville, and the funniest thing you'll see in the video is we came around the corner and there was hundreds of people at the dock. We're like, wow, all these people are here to see us? No, there was a bathtub race, a Huntsville bathtub race going on, and we were actually paddling in the race, and the, the organizer was yelling at us to get us out of, out of the race, and that's how we finished the trip. <laughs> um, I'm gonna show you the video now. Uh, it's really cool, I, I did a huge tour, and all these people, they're sponsors, but they're all my friends. I've been paddling in, in the canoe business for well over 35 years, and. Uh, and it was really cool when I said, hey, I wrote my, my own first book, uh, my, my first published book. Can you help me out with the speaking tour? All these people said yes, absolutely. So I'd like to thank them all. It's really cool to be in a, in a t community that is like that. So uh, yeah, it's really nice that they, they helped out. All right, are you ready? Andy. I, I signed a letter that he sent me, and it agreed uh, that I'm not allowed to plan any canoe trip for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so the next year, he's, he said, okay, we're going on an eight-day trip. I said, where he goes? I'm not telling you. And he literally blindfolded me. We were going north. I had no idea where we were going. We ended up going to Georgian Bay and doing eight, eight days along the, the shores of Georgian Bay. And I said, why? He goes, there's no portaging. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, he also, he had major surgery to his knee because his knee went out um, after that. I, I didn't really know actually, he didn't tell me all about this. Uh, but yeah, would I do it again? Um, there's no need to do it again. <laughs> but uh, I like the idea of what happened to us at the end. We really reconnected to nature and traveling in the bush was the norm. And I guess that's what happens when, uh, when you go on a long trip. If you go for a short trip, you're still phobic about it, like we were talking about outside. You're still phobic of, of, of the surroundings. I mean, I, tomorrow night I'll be in the bush, I swear I, the bear's gonna kill me, right? But by, by day five, day six, the bear hasn't killed me, so I'm gonna be fine. So um, that's what happened to us. We did not want to finish the trip. We, we wanted to keep going. Something that was happening to me at that time too that Andy didn't know <clears throat> um, was I was going through a personal thing um, uh, my wife of over 20 years wanted a separation and she told me this uh, before that trip and so that trip was kind of a uh, What's it called? Forest bathing for me? So uh, because one Yes, yes, and it, it actually helped me a lot. Now Andy, nobody knew. Andy didn't know and he was a really good friend to actually go on that trip with me and finish it with me because really I had a purpose for being out there. He didn't um, well, maybe he did, I don't know, but I didn't know. But, but in one sense, it really helped me to be out there. And if you want to deal with a portage, um, that's nothing compared to things on, on, in your life. And also, it's, it's not really scary out there. I mean, the 401 the other night was a lot scarier than the woods. So, uh, so it was a really good trip for that. I, uh, I wrote that book up, and it, it was a good thing. I, I basically would wake up every morning for about, like five years on the porch with a cup of coffee and write away. And, and there's a lot of different things that I haven't really talked about in it, so I hope it's, it's good. What's really cool is it's doing really well. Um, Self-publishing is a nightmare. I've done like 17 books with a publisher, all you know, bestsellers, whatever, so why would I actually walk away from that? Well, just to be different. Uh, I wanted to actually be my own boss, to actually know that I'm going to get the royalties, that I know, not that, see, I make no money writing. As a Canadian author, I make nothing, right? But I know that, I knew that going into it. There was no surprise. But at the same time is that, um, uh, I wanted to make sure that what the content was what I wanted. So, uh, and self-publishing is a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, and it cost me over 5,000 to actually get that book done. But I make 70 to 40% of the book royalties. The old days, I made eight. So all those 17 books, all bestsellers, I was making 8%, and someone else was making a lot of money. And I'm thinking, well, <laughs> So in a library, I'm not sure, uh, what's really interesting is I went through what's called Ingram Spark. It's a, it's a print on demand. So it wasn't Amazon. It was, uh, so what they do is they actually send it to libraries and bookstores and like um, the brick and mortar books and stuff like that. So, so that's kind of cool. And I made my money back in a month. So uh, the reason why is a whole bunch of people that I know as friends in the canoe world wrote reviews for it because they read it before it went out and they said, Kevin, this is a really good book. And I went, okay, thanks. But Roy McGregor, like amazing Canadian writer, he, he did a really amazing review. James Raffin with the Canoe Museum, um, Alec Ross at Paddle Across Canada, just a whole bunch of people. And it was really kind of cool. 
Well, thanks a lot for coming out. And uh, uh, yeah, have a look at the book if you want. And it's it's 20 bucks even, and it's on Amazon. And I don't know if you have one in your library or not, but. Uh, we're going to get one tonight. Okay. <laughs> okay, but thanks a lot for coming out. I hope you have a good season, and hope you have a good trip going, going out. Yeah, yeah, so this is fantastic. Thanks a lot. Thank you.